was gonna ask you. I was gonna go here, go. Do the joke again. She wasn't recording. Yeah. We're good. Okay. So today, oh wait, should I start, DJ? Yeah. Okay. Today, Ben and I are doing our presentation on wealth creation and risk management. We're gonna start with some definitions, and some videos, and uh, some stuff about markets. Real fun stuff. All right. So the first thing we want to talk to you about today is wealth creation and risk management, since obviously that's what we're talking about. Um, wealth creation is defined as the act of making a country, group, per or person more rich or successful, or it's also like the accumulation of assets um, that generate income over a long period of time, like, you know, your retirement plan. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Then we have our risk management, which is when like an investor's it's like an investor's ability or willingness to accept um, declines in the value of investments while waiting for them to increase in value. So like uh, like a low risk management would be willing like would be like the investor's uh, ability willing to take a chance, and then a greater risk management would be like willing to take the risk. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. So now we have some cool videos. Oh. Maybe, maybe not. You might have to turn up the volume. No, don't go too far. Is it turned? Is the volume on there? Like, yeah, check the computer. Press this, like, escape and see if the whole microphone. No. Oh, no. Thanks, you guys. Oh, it is up. Okay. The most important things you can do. So what is risk tolerance? In its simplest form, it's you deciding how long you can stay invested before you'll get bumped out. In other words, how much risk can you stand? We believe that when you put together an investment plan, one of the most important things you can do is to set your risk tolerance properly. If you set your risk level too high... Ah! Dang it! I, got, I was trying to push it up. I'm sorry, guys. And likewise, if it's set too low, then you won't get the returns that you need to meet your objectives. In other words, we know the market's going to be going up and down over time, so we know that you're going to see fluctuations in your account. And the way you keep yourself from getting out of the market at the worst possible time is to set your risk tolerance correctly. It's, it's a huge reason that people fail. You know, a lot of people just show up, here's my $200,000, put it you know, in XYZ fund, and you know, actually, you know, XYZ fund down 40%, and they jump out, and XYZ fund recovers, and now it's back, and they're down 40%. That's their life experience of investing. They just lost $80,000. You're trying to blend together their real needs and objectives with their actual risk tolerance, and that takes you to some kind of a mix. The perfect scenario for our clients, I believe, is that they don't care what the market's doing. They're not constantly checking the market because their risk tolerance is set properly in the very beginning. Setting your risk tolerance can be difficult, and because of that, we've created this questionnaire. This questionnaire asks you questions in a variety of ways to fully understand what your risk tolerance is. And so this questionnaire really simplifies the process and helps you identify exactly what your risk tolerance really is. If you're married, then both you and your companion should take the questionnaire and compare results. That way you can come to a risk level that works between the both of you. Now once you've completed the survey and identified your risk tolerance, then we'll have you move on to step three, where we'll incorporate that risk tolerance with your long-term goals.
when it comes to investing. Because after all, you have to decide how much risk to take when it comes to your investments. And what's also challenging about your risk tolerance is that it means different things to different people. If I'm investing $100, risk to some people means I lost everything. To other people, risk might mean that my $100 is now worth $90. And yet a third way people might view risk is that I was expecting my $100 to grow to $110, and it only grew to $105. So <coughs> risk tolerance really can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. But I want you to focus on a few things as it relates to your risk tolerance. How comfortable are you with investments? Uh, first of all, if you don't understand the investments that you're putting money into, that's a formula for disaster, so you want to stick away from that. But as it relates to investing in stocks and bonds and other types of investments, what are you comfortable with and what aren't you comfortable with? For most people, it can make sense to balance out their risk tolerance by investing in different types of investments, some that are aggressive and growth-oriented, and some that are very conservative um, as a way of balancing out their risk. But it's important, and I want to ask you, if you invested $10,000 today, what would be too much risk for you? Where are you comfortable with it? The markets are going to go up, they're going to go down, and a lot of that is out of your control. But you can make sure you're following an investment plan that makes sense for your situation as based on your risk tolerance. It's kind of the sleep at night factor, if you will. You know, if you're the type of person and you have that personality where you do your investing and it's out of sight, out of mind, you're not thinking about it too much, then perhaps you can invest a little bit more aggressively. If you're up at night worried about investments and the stock market stressing you out and you're reading about it on the internet or in the newspaper, maybe you're complaining to your spouse about it, that can be a sign that you're investing too aggressively for your personal tolerance for risk. And so the key factors when you're choosing investments are going to be always how you feel personally about risk and what the rest of your situation looks like before choosing any investments or before investing your money. So I know when I was um, writing a paper about this, um, I didn't know a lot about investments and I didn't know a lot about risk, um, yeah. risk tolerance. Tell tolerance. Um, back, I found somewhere online that back in the 1990s, the stock market was kind of like, woo thing, like people invest, were like investing everywhere, and so it's, nowadays, people, they're a lot more careful with that, obviously, with our inflation and all that junk, and um, it's just, we kind of were showing you this because maybe you're not investing in stock markets right now, or markets, but when you do start, decide to start doing that and saving your money in junk, it's really important to understand well, do I have the money for this? Do I have the time for this? Can I save money? Like, you don't want it to stress you out and stuff, so, yeah. And one of the bigger things that they really didn't talk about on that is, <clears throat> and I hate to use the word, but somebody my age is going to have a different risk tolerance than some of you guys. So some of the risk tolerance that you guys may look at, you don't want to look so much short term. You want to look long term. You want to think, 15 years down the road, 20 years down the road, 25 years down the road, where do I want to be? That's where you start to look at your risk tolerance. Again, my risk tolerance is going to be a little bit different. So you start to look at, if you're doing your different funds and stuff like that, Roth IRAs, mutual funds that we get into, stocks, bonds, stuff like that, that's where you start to really look at, what am I willing to lose? The biggest piece of that is you want to have your cushion. You always want to have that at least six month rainy day, oh my goodness, sky's falling fund. This is everything that we're kind of discussing here, wealth management, risk tolerance, stuff like that, is usually after that fact. So kind of keep that in mind as we're kind of going through when they're starting to talk about the different investments and stuff like that. Like cash, that's one of the easier ones. The downside with cash, cash is not a bad investment right now, but your return on investment, or ROI, that we've discussed about in a couple of different chapters, is very, very minimal right now. So you're not going to have, this is kind of one of those very low risk, low yield investments. You may get a little bit, but you could, we'll use this $100 example. You could invest $100 today, you could wait 10 years, you could have $115. It's 
is kind of how cash really kind of flows. There's not a whole lot of big over uh, over that. Real property is really talking about real estate. Um, if anybody can really get into real estate right now, it's one of those markets that's it's either really good or really bad. It is. If you go back on property, it's location, location, location. If you're sitting on a piece of property out in the middle up here that not a whole lot of traffic is going to go to, it's not going to be that big of an investment. If it's one that you know that, let's say, Walmart might be looking at, it might be worth doing an investment on. Um, and of course, shares, stocks, bonds, fixed interest investments are kind of self explanatory. Those are your Roth IRAs, your mutual funds. Um, here are some investment principles that we have. These are principles that have been found that were really, really important when you're investing in check. Okay, so, What's the first one? Start early. Start early. I can't hear you. Start early. Start early. Come on, we're teachers. Come on. Start, Start early. early. Thank you. <laughs> Invest regularly and reinvest returns. So, yeah, obviously that's really, really important. Um, you want to set your investment goals, which is kind of what I was talking about, and what Ben was talking about. You want to make sure that you have the right goals. Like obviously, like you don't want to like buy like a thousand dollar thing if you only have ten dollars or something. I don't know. All right. Uh, diversification. Don't. Yeah. Don't put all your eggs in the basket. That sense. That's the biggie. That's what one of the. If you go back through all the things that we were reading when the financial collapse started to happen, you look at like Enron and companies like that. That was one of the big ones. They were actually telling people to invest almost everything into that company. So when that company failed, bye bye retirement. It's been nice knowing you. Have fun. See you, see you on the island. Diversification. Not only is it diversification of funds, but really look at the. the yeah, that Diversification of industries as well. Not only look at like tech stocks, look at. Retail stocks. I mean, you could go anywhere from, say, Coca-Cola to Ironworks. Because a lot of times in that diversification, you're going to have those risk tolerances are going to be built in on each individual fund. So you could say Coca-Cola, which is pretty steady, or Ironworks, which may kind of fluctuate with the market depending on what the day's market prices are, what's going on, you know, buildings and stuff like that. So with that one. That is almost as key as that one. Because this is really going to drive everything for you long term. Um, then we have number four, which it's time in the not it's time in the market, not timing the market. So I like by that I think you meant like um, don't long term goals, don't everybody the market's change. Yes. Yeah. The market is a very fickle thing. It will be up one day and everybody will be happy, happy. And it'll be one day, and people will be like, just, it just, it happens that way. What, what happens is, when you're looking at time in the market, is the fact that people will be really, really happy when it's up, because they'll see their portfolios really grow, and they'll be like, oh, yes, I went from $100 to $200. And then they'll dive, and they'll like, I just lost it, and now I have five. And they'll sell, and they'll get out. The market will bounce right back. It's, it's, the more... When it goes down, that's not a bad thing. It's not something to be scared about. I know there are a lot of people out there, especially with from 2008 till today, with how the financial markets have gone. If you actually look at the market, they've actually been a bull market for the last five years or so. So it's actually now would be a, a good time to start going towards and looking at different things like that. And invest in the long term. <coughs> Bless you. It, it's, one trade. Yeah. Set that goal. 20 years. 25 years. You're going to figure by the time you're done teaching, you've put in at least 25 years. Would Think rather, there. Hmm? Would you rather want to let keep working at, like, as a teacher when you're 85? Or, I mean, maybe some of us would, but, um, or would you like to live <laughs> on that island of the or something? You know? I would like to own the island. Or own the island, even. So. <laughs> 
All right, so now we have some games. I think I was supposed to send us the games. Okay, that's okay, cool. No, that's okay. We do have a game for you guys, but we're going to do it more towards the end. These are really good games for using in a classroom. There's a downside, though. These games take time. Okay. Most of these games, um, one of them actually is a fee-based one. It's like a $40 one, but you can set it up for your entire class. Um, the other ones you can actually do differently. You can set it up to do just your group class. What's neat about those is you can tell your class, we're going to start with most of them, it was the same starting amount. It was about $100,000. So you can tell your class, you have $100,000 in which to invest anything. They can invest, I keep using Apple. They can invest in Apple, which I think when I last checked it was like $140 a share or something. Um, they can do stuff like that. They can do textiles. They can do anything. What's cool about it is they have a ranking system, so it'll actually track. According to this, is all virtual, so it's nobody's money, it's all funny money. It will track. And you can post leaderboards and see how everybody does. You can actually build it into your metrics on instructions in the class and stuff like that. So they can see how everything works. And we've all done the financial literacy when we went out to the class. We were showing everybody how to do different things like that. So it's kind of, they can go through, set it up pick their stocks. If they want to sell, they can sell. They can start changing. You can set a specific amount within it. And all three games are kind of a variation of the theme. It's really just finding one that, that's best with you. There's even one, um, the one that's 40, it's the stock market game. It's the bottom one. They actually have national competitions. So if you have, say, a class and you want to go against another class, you know, if you, let's say you're working in a district that has a couple different buildings. So if you're teaching over at Bowser and you want to say, hey, start, I think we can do better than you guys in this game. We're going to beat you guys. That's it's not a show me guys. Oh, that's okay. exciting. You can do different things like that. So you can set all that fun fun stuff up. It's all good competition. But even in the class, everybody can look at all the different things. We do have another game a little bit later for you guys. And um, and may I add course. something to that? Yes, ma'am. You could create, let's say, you're teaching in a middle school and you're doing stock market mm -hmm. and you could create teams like your pods mm -hmm. at your tables you could create teams in your classroom and they could compete against each other mm -hmm. they name themselves they make money mm -hmm. they lose money but they but world. they compete against each other which and is I've remember, seen as really a lot of fun and if I remember just block this one away and remember makes this bottom one if I remember the stock market game which is I think it's SWMGG, something like that. Yeah. Stock market game. You have to go back there, and unfortunately, we can't pull it up. It ties to Common Core. Right. You can tie that in your lesson, like in your Common Core, where you can write all your find it. There actually is an Ohio chapter, which I think is really that and there's And there's also money out there. If your mm -hmm. school doesn't have money, to it may be forty dollars for a teacher to enroll all your students in a game, or it may be um, there's one of the games. I don't know whether it's SMG or SMS that it's five dollars a team, but they have money for schools. You can apply for a grant, get the money for your kids to participate. But the but the other thing is um, some of the banks will sponsor those teams. And then we'll provide money for pizza or right, sandwiches think, uh, and pop for the winning. I think stock market game even gives away like a twenty dollar gift card or something like that mm -hmm. for the winning. So there are different things that you guys can incorporate in the classroom. <coughs> there we go. Yeah. 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 Okay, now we're gonna talk about financial markets. <laughs> okay, because these are really important because obviously these are things you're investing in or are going to be investing in when you are looking at your retirement plans and junk. All right, let's first talk about primary and secondary markets, which I have on the same paper. So who can give me an example of this primary market? Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. Primary markets. Who can give an example of a primary market? Stocks. Thank you, stocks. All right, way to go. <laughs> All right, how about a second one? <laughs> Thank you. Funds. <laughs> Alright. And the most common. Oh, 
Mutual funds. <laughs> mutual funds. Woohoo! All right. All right. Mutual funds. Mutual funds is the most non volatile investment out of the primary market. I say that because in mutual funds, it's an automatic built in diversification. If anybody's ever looked at a mutual fund setup, you can go, okay, I want to do. X amount of percent here. I want to do, I'm going to invest $100. I'm going to do $10 here, I'm going to do $20 here, I'm going to do $40 here. You can spread it out. And you can move. As the market changes, you can go, okay, I'm getting a better return out of this market. So I'm going to take $10 out of this, and I'm going to only do about $5 on this one, and I'm going to flip it over and do $10 here. Okay. How about the secondary market?
bond markets, bonds, if any time a bond comes up, it's usually you're investing money into um, a bond issue for school. So you're going to invest on that. Uh, money markets, pretty self-explanatory. You stick with the money, it starts to grow long term. Everybody say long term. Long term. Long -term. Long term. Long term. Kill me. Okay. And now we have these cash, sometimes they're called cash spot markets, and derivative markets. Cash spot markets, um, they're kind of a big deal. You don't, yeah, I don't, you don't want to kind of get into these unless you're a big corporation or, you know, a big government thing. If you're just an inexperienced investor, it's something you might not want to do. Um, because they have really big gains and really big losses. Um, big time risk tolerance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, goods are sold and delivered with cash immediately. Contracts are started immediately, you know, with purchase. Um, they're brought at current market price versus like forward market price where like these other, other markets were like, oh, well, here's the price, you know, and like they, Kind of, you can have a chance to like, oh, I don't want to. But these are, you get what you see, and it's it's not suited for, you know, like I said, it's very experienced. Um, like, it, yeah, it's dominated by like limited partnerships, corporate investors, um, and it requires access to like lots of information about my, macroeconomics analysis um, and trading skills. Like, you have to have a little, really good trading skills so you only use like this. So. Something you might not want to do unless you maybe maybe you do own a really big corporation and I'm not aware of it. So some <laughs> college funds. <laughs> college funds are free. <laughs> okay. Now we have our derivative market. It's in the name, it's values derived from underlying assets. Okay? Uh, a contract is determined by market price at the I can't read my handwriting. Where price is determined by market price at the core asset. So, again, this is not another ideal, don't think about it, but I mean, think about it, but don't think about investing in it, for very serious <laughs> traders, because it adds kind of another layer to the whole market thing. Um, it's really good for risk management programs, though. So, by risk management programs, then this. By risk management programs? There's ones that will actually help you calculate what the dollars of how you're going to figure everything out. Essentially tell it, I want this amount of money, I want this amount of risk. Yeah. Uh, kind of cheats. Um, and some examples of derivative markets would be forwards, futures, options, swaps, and contracts for difference, or CFDs. Um, all really complex instruments. Something that maybe you might want to dabble in if you want to drop your job as a teacher and be a really big the four, or actually, I'm going to do this one first. The interbank market. Um, it's a financial system and trading of currencies among banks and financial institutions. So there's no retail investors, there's no small trading parties, and it usually takes place around banks' own, like the bank's own accounts. Banks with banks. Yeah, banks with banks. Yeah. Um, the forex, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Forex, forex. forex market is where currencies are traded. Um, it's kind of the huge mama of like investing like markets. Like it's the most like it every day. It's like Ben said that it has like 1.9 trillion dollars invested into it. So it's kind of a big deal. It's like the world investor of things. Like, um, and usually trade is conducted over the counter. And it used to be that um, this was like for the big guys up top, like the corporates, governments, all that junk. But basically the internet, good old thing, uh, average guys can do it now. And stuff through brokerage accounts. Bro brokerage accounts, yeah. So kind of a big deal. And it's available to us now. Well, not us, but average guys, because we're still I'm going to assume most of them are still inexperienced. 
The over-the-counter market, it's actually a secondary. Uh, it's known more as a dealer market. Um, these are actually stocks that are not traded on your normal stock exchange. So, not like black blue or blue. Not doing things like that. Um, usually this is like on the Amex, uh, American, American Stock Exchange. Um, sometimes you'll even run into Uh, not your normal or your average everyday investor is going to take up. I mean, there are all of these other different markets. They're nice and beautiful and they have a lot of money. But it's, it's one of those, these are, if you really want to start digging into different markets and stuff like that, to, a lot of people have really started going towards the OTC markets, the Forex markets, the inter, not supposed to be everybody. Um, they don't trust the NASDAQ. They don't trust the NYSE. They've had too much up and down. And frankly, a couple companies really messed it up. You, you have investors that you know, are doing hand over fist, and you know, it just, people don't trust the normal market. So that's why you're starting to see more and more of these markets stop and pop up uh, as, as people get more back into. volumes of shares to be transacted per trade. So again, it's kind of like it's kind of like the uh, derivative market because there's shares. There's a vocab test in this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, um, they deal with transactions between broke broke dealers and large institutions, and like he was talking about the over counter electronic um, networks. So like doing everything over the counter, right? Um, that was the fourth market. Or no, that's both markets. Okay, sorry. Going to the third market, this is mostly that OTC transaction that he was talking about between um, broke dealers and large institutions. And then the fourth market is kind of like transa transact the transactions that take place between the big companies in general. Um, the main reason these things occur, like transactions occur, is to avoid placing these orders through the main exchange. And that's really important because it could affect the price of the security. And for companies, like big, big companies, that's kind of a big deal. So yeah, if it affects the price of their stocks or market, it might be a big deal for the companies, right? So um, because access to third and fourth markets is limited, their activities do not, because it's limited, because they're big, they're not going to affect you guys, OK? Um, most financial institutions and markets help the firms raise money, and um, you can do this by paying out loans, like we talked about, through interest, issuing bonds, um, and you know paying them back at fixed interest rates, or offering investors personal ownership in the company. I don't know why I'm reading that, but yeah, third and fourth stock markets for big companies, um, they. They have big transactions. Again, just kind of go back to the derivative markets. Big stocks. Not not a big deal for you guys if they go up or down, but for companies, it kind of are. Because if they went, they kind of help them if their shares go up or if their shares go so, Yeah. And okay. this is real. Oh yeah, you got it. <laughs> DJ, please jump in if I say anything. <laughs> for most of us that are not for most of us, for all of us that are going into education. There is a built-in uh, retirement plan. It's called STRS. Uh, Only in Ohio. Yes. I found a couple that were Texas, California. There's nothing like STRS okay. anywhere else. Thank you. Okay. So for those of you, for everybody that's staying in the state of Ohio, there's STRS. And I can't remember. State Teachers Retirement System. 
Essentially what they do is they take a percentage of your paycheck and automatically put it into these particular types of funds. There is a group of managers that manage this particular fund for you. Okay. So it, it's kind of your built-in uh, certified financial plan. Now there's a couple different markets uh, that really invest in real estate, different things like that. Now, if Everyone in here, STRS is not going to pay for your entire retirement. It will be nice, but it's not going to take care of the things that you may want to take care of. Let's say you want to own that island, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. Hang out with Wilson. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those. STRS is nice because it starts to give you you're automatically building into this fund. Um, what you want to start to look at is after having your STRS taken out, it's, it's an automatic, guys. It doesn't, there really is no way around it unless you don't want to teach it. That, that's, it's, it's a given, it's going to happen. Um, but it will actually fluctuate as well uh, with the market, so you kind of have to pay attention to it. There are technically three different um, parts of the investment. Uh, once you sign on and sign your paperwork for STRS, you have 180 days, mm -hmm. something like that. Which, if you think about it, 180 days is five days short of one full calendar school year. School year is usually 185 days. So you have one year to kind of figure out where you want to make this. What you see behind me, if I get my big head out of the way, is happened to come across this. Uh, this is actually written by, it was an article that was written by a librarian, currently active teaching. She had a couple different tips. Um, the first one, and most important, pay yourself first. Take care of the things you need to take care of. So it's not combined library. No. no. Okay. Take care of decisions. <laughs> it's the same thing we've talked about here in the class. Wants versus needs. You have to take care of the things that are primary. Roof over your head, food in your bed, gas in the car. You gotta get, you gotta work. <laughs> so you gas in the car. And you grow. Take 15, 10, or 5 to 10 percent of net pay. Invest. Now, a lot of different people will tell you a lot of different things. Can you tell me how 401k has its name? Just an interesting one. Anyway, anyway. Kind of useless piece of information. But it's section 401 of the IRS tax code, subsection K. There are different ones. There's 401Bs, which is section 401 of the IRS tax code, if you want some really good bedtime reading, subsection B. <laughs> now, some of the bigger things that you guys have to look at, Roth IRAs, um, I know I've mentioned a couple of times, look at how they do taxes. Is taxes on the front end, or is taxes on the back end? This is really going to play an important piece into how you look at your investments. If, for say, some odd reason, you've already burned through your rainy day fund, let's say you have six or your rainy day fund, you've already burned through it, and you have to go against what you've used as an investment, you're either going to get taxed on the back end, or you're going to get taxed on the front end. With investments, it's better, in my experience, to have it on the front end. Because if you don't, on the back end, they're stuck in a dinghy again, come tuck stuck. So that's what, when she's talking about take 5 to 10% of your net pay, take that, take that and put it in, into a separate set, Roth IRA, 401Bs. Look at those different things. Take charge of your paycheck. Know where your money's going. How many of us remember our fun little budget exercise? <laughs> oh, come on. You guys are tired. Is it warm in here? No. Take charge of your paycheck. No one's gone. You know what you're doing. And don't be responsible. Don't go out and you know, buy a lemonade. You know. We're not all hot teachers. Come on. Has anybody seen the movie? No? Movie right is dead? Okay. <laughs> Keep your receipts. This is a biggie. As a teacher, a lot of times you're going to have to do things out of pocket. It's just the way things work anymore.
school districts don't have a whole lot of money, especially if you're, let's say you're working, not to pick on Eastwood. Very rural, kind of very spread out, not a whole lot of capital. Keep your receipts. A lot of times, check with your principals, your BOEs, different things like that. They're going to be able to have some type of a short step. That $40 that Ethan and I were discussing earlier for that game, if you had to pay for that out of your pocket, keep your receipt. Earn it. A lot of times, the worst case they're going to think, or worst, the worst case thing that they can say is they need to. But it's, it's always worth it to keep. PJ, you had it. You automatically, if you itemize your deductions, which I'm sure most of you don't do right now, you do the 1040 easy, but when you become a teacher, um, you may have the opportunity to itemize your deductions. And if you do so, right now, it's $250. As a teacher, you automatically get to write off. So as a teacher, if you keep your receipts, and I mean you buy... Um, I know lots of teachers who buy a um, jar full of candy and they'll go to like a warehouse store and buy, you know, whatever, hard candy and put it in there and kids can earn it as a treat. Okay, well, if you keep your receipt for that and let's say you bought that uh, once a month and you spent $10, okay, that's 90 bucks of your 250 you also bought some other things for your classroom. Maybe you bought, um, I don't know, a flash drive to keep your stuff on, or you bought a new computer to work with at school. All of those things are deductible expenses. And, and that's where you can spend your wealth or you can keep your wealth, okay? And you can grow your wealth if you keep it. Now we're going to look at this game that we have for you guys. Okay. Really quick. And then that one for Vietnam. If you don't have a computer, there are iPads back here. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I do. I don't have a smartphone, but this one. Yeah, this is what I need. So, very sure I wrote it This is a little funny. Um, what it does is. What you're gonna do when you get in to the website, once we give it to you, is do you want to send the website to everybody? If you if you go to your B, my BGSU and click on the course and go to people, you can send it to everyone. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. Well, yeah. In Canvas. Really fun stuff for me. What it does is it randomly picks a year. And it gives you two different choices of what you want to do within the market. So you can either be a big shot, and I forget what the second one. But what you can do, and it gives you against three other people. What it will do is on the two different sets of stocks, you'll actually follow the market. And it'll ask you if you want to hold, if you want to sell, if you want to buy more. So if you want to grab more and invest them. But it'll track, and it'll give you your wins and losses. What's kind of neat about it is it doesn't tell you which company it picks. It'll tell you what year, and it'll kind of give you a quick snapshot of everything that's happened within that year. I know. Yeah. You got it? Okay. <laughs> it should be coming shortly. It's mrmrvigshot.com. Yeah. It's no, this is not one of those types of signs. Mm. <laughs> 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 Wait, is it, is it wow, just MR Big Shot? Yeah. yeah. MR Big Shot. Mr. Big Shot. 
I know. It's, a, it's one of the uh, titles. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm I just switched my What are you talking about? So we got it. Okay, cool. Right oh, really? there. Yeah. Should it should be like a red one. If you guys just go to the demo. It does. Okay. Because they do have... Where it's a random year and it goes through and it actually gives you a quick snapshot. Just click on demo, guys. It'll give you a quick snapshot, but it'll tell you what's happening. So if you don't want to blast everybody out in the class, since everybody's kind of doing a different thing, I'm sure we're going to have several different years going on. Get flash. Uh oh. Sorry. Yeah. Wait, what's the one? MrBigShot.com. Yeah, but it requires flash. It requires flash, which Apple does not support flash. So. But it does. Um, I mean, if you have it downloaded on your computer, it works. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I don't think it'll work on the iPad. Yeah. <laughs> it says get flash. Yeah, it says get flash. But then it took me to that X. Yeah. If you. Oh, yeah. There's a brand for Yeah. What is it? She's like Google Chrome. You can use it. It's called a Pocket Browser, but you have to download it. Welcome to the Big Shot. Yeah. 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 Our company was Johnson Controls. 
I have a drink so I'm thinking like that in, in a while. Ah, nice. Oh, see, so it kind of gives you a nice idea it's all history, of how to, yeah, it's yeah. kind of nice. So, and, uh, you know, we kind of drop it. In the year 1998, Bill Clinton becomes the first president since Andrew Johnson kind of being impeached and tried. Kind of Death of fault by the Russian government leads to a plunge on the ruble's value. And Europeans agree on a single currency. The euro is born. Let's pick some stocks. Pick your stocks here. Shot and store it. You can always call your broker. Find out how much you're worth. You guys are all loaded. I expect to see some money to fly. Oh, they're going to invest. How much do we have? $10,000. That's it? Yeah, let's go for it. Go ahead. Go make a home. <laughs> Whoa, that stock's making money. Max it out. Hold it. Hold it. Max it out. Up the numbers. Ah, uh, there went the Christmas bonus. Saying that, then just you don't want to lose that. You want to turn that ten and add several more zeros at the end. Uh, so you got to be honest with yourself when you're looking at your risk tolerance. Uh, a lot of times, I would say, with where you guys are at in life, you guys can take a little more risk because you have longer to make it. So those are certain things you have to look at. But when you're looking at your investments, do yourself a real big favor. Look at five years down the road. Where do you want to be? How much do you want to have? Kind of put away. Be honest with it. Where you want to be at 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. If you want to own that island, use a visual board. Put your island right there and say, I'm going to own that, sir. I'm going to get hit by hurricanes every year, but that's okay. I'll just build myself a motor. We're good. 